turn to Ezra chapter number 8 as we work our way through the book of Ezra. We have a number of recurring themes that we see in this book that take place of rebuilding and reformation after the exile into Babylon of God's children. Uh, to give you a road map this morning, we're going to read our text and then we have 3.5 points to make. You say, how can you have half a point? But I have lived long enough to know that most people only have about half a point. <laughs> Ezra chapter number 8, verse number 1. These are the heads of the fathers' houses, and this is the genealogy of those who went up from Babylonia in the reign of Artaxerxes the king, of the son of Phinehas, Gershom, and the sons of Ithmar, Daniel, and the sons of David, Hadash. Of the sons of Sekaniah, the, uh, the, who was the son of Perosh, Sekaniah, and whom was registered 150 men, of the sons of Pehath Moab, Elioni, the son of Zerahiah, there were, and with him 200 men, the sons of Zetu, Sekaniah, the son of Jehaziel, and with him 300 men, of the sons of Aden, Ebed, the son of Jonathan, and with him 50 men, the sons of Elam, Jeshiah, uh, the son of Athaliah, uh, with him 70 men, the sons of Shepheth, Shephatiah, Zebediah, the sons of Michael, and with him 80 men. The sons of Joab, Obadiah, the son of Jehiel, uh, and with him 218 men. The sons of Bani, Shelem, uh, uh, the sons of Joseph, uh, and with him 160 men. The sons of Bedai, Zechariah, and the son of Bedai, and with him 28 men. The sons of Asgad, Johanan, the sons of Hakatan, and with him 110 men. And of the sons of Adoniakim, and with and who came later with the names of Eliphelet, uh, Jehuel, uh, and Shemai, and with him sixty men, the sons of Bigvi, Uthai, and Zachar, and with them seventy men. Uh, amen. amen. <laughs> <laughs> there needs to be a seminary course on how to pronounce Old Testament names. Okay, um, verse number fifteen. I gathered with them uh, to the river uh, that runs to Ahava. And there was a camp there three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found with him the sons of Levi. And I sent to, for him Eliezer, Ariel, Shemai, uh, Elnathan, Jerob, Elnathan, Nathan, um, uh, Zechariah, and Meshalem, leading men. And for Jera, uh, Jerarib and Elnathan, who were the men of insight, and sent them to Ido, uh, the leading man in the place of uh, Casaphia, uh, telling them what to say to Ido and his brothers and the temple servants in the place of Casaphia, namely to send ministers for the house of God and by good hand for our God on us. They brought us a man of discretion, the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, the son of Sherebah, the sons and kinsmen, also Hashbia, and with him Jeshiah, and the sons of Merari, and his kinsmen and their sons, uh, 20, and besides 220 of the temple servants whom David and his officials had sent apart to attend the Levites, uh, these were all mentioned by name. Verse 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, uh, that we might uh, humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, for our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. Then I set apart twelve of the leading priests, Sheriba, Hashbia, and ten other kinsmen with them, and I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels and the offering for the house of our God that the kins king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel uh, there present had offered. I weighed out their hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels worth 200 talents and 100 talents of gold. Twenty bowls of gold worth a thousand derricks, and two uh, vessels of fine bright bronze as precious as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to the Lord, and the vessels are holy, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering to the Lord, the God of your fathers. Guard them and keep them until you weigh them before the chief priest and the Levites and the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel at Jerusalem, within the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites took over the weight of the silver and gold of the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem to the house of our God. Then they, we departed from the river Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. The hand of our God was on us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from the ambushes by the way. And we came to Jerusalem, and there we remained three days. On the fourth day, within the house of our God, the silver and the gold and the vessels were weighed into the hands of Memoth, the priest, son of Uriah, 
And with him, Eliezer, the son of Phinehas, and with them were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Joshua, and Neodib, Neodiah, uh, the son of Benui. Uh, the whole was counted and weighed, and the weight of everything was recorded. At that time, those who had come from captivity and the returned exiles offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. Uh, all this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's commissions to the king's satraps and to the governors and to the province beyond the river, and they aided the people in the house of God. Now, some of this may be daunting to you because you hear all these funny names that we're not used to, and you see all these lists of things, and you think, well, why does this matter? Well, if it was your family that was listed in these names, it would matter. And if it was your money listed in these donations, it would matter to you. And so it mattered to them all these thousands of years ago. What we see here, and we saw last chapter, in chapter number 7, we saw that the hand of God was upon his people. The hand of God was working to help Ezra and to help the Israelites. The hand of God was there to, to motivate and move world events for the good of his people. And here, too, we get that same theme. Three times again, we see this phrase, the good hand of our God was on us. So what is our response to God's hand on us? Last week we saw God's hand is on his people, continually on his people, never leaves from his people. So what do we then do in response to this glorious truth that his hand is with us? Well, slide number one, point number one. Walking with God's hand responds with a dedication of time, our worship to him, that we spend with him, that we give to him. Just as a father and a son may walk hand in hand together, so too if we are going to walk with God or are walking with God, we need to spend time with him. We see that in this big list of all the sons that came and were sent, and notice in verse number 17, at the end of 17, what is one of the first priorities that they had? To send us ministers of the house of God, and by the good hand of our God on us. They brought the men at their discretion. Why were they wanting these sons of Levi? Why were they wanting these ministers for the house of God? Because worship was of prime importance. We saw this uh, back in chapter number 2. The very first thing that they started to build was the altar of God. Before walls, before battlements, before houses, they started on the worship of God. Us too, our priority in life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We should worship Him. There is a phrase that often comes up and um, it, it always kinds of irks me a, a little bit, and, and, and people, and it's, it's well-meaning phrase, but they always say, you know, you, well, you need to be the church. I'm not the church in and by myself alone. We are the church. We together, gathered together, uh, it, according to the Bible, is the church. That church, that word, it's the called out assembly. And for Christians... Attending church is a moral obligation on us. We are called by our Lord, by our Father who is walking with us to gather together. The way that God shows his grace to us is in the gifts of corporate prayer and the Lord's Supper and the preaching of the word and singing together. This is God's way of saying, I want to feed you, son, daughter. I want to spend time with you in a special way that is unique and different than the time we spent by ourselves alone. In fact, we have more time off. We think of our time as precious, and time is indeed precious. But we have more time off than ever in the history of the world. How old do you think the 40-week work week is, 40-hour work week is? And that didn't start till 1938 which in the scope of human history is, is super tiny. If we had a timeline of human history, 1938 would be but a sliver from then to now of 40 hours as the standard full-time work week, and yet church attendance is often lower than ever. We say, well, I don't have time, or I feel too stressed, or I have other things I need to worry about. More than spending time and walking hand with your father who wants to spend time with you. There is an old Russian proverb, the church is near, but the roads are icy. 
The pub is far, but we'll walk carefully. <laughs> what we want to do, we usually find a way of doing. What is this corporate gathering of worship together? Biblically, here's a few things. Worship corporately is not just any gathering of Christians. It is not just meeting another Christian brother for coffee. It's not just going to Denny's. It's not just uh, having people over at your house, even though those are great and fantastic things. Acts 18.26 and 1 Corinthians 14.35 both point that it is the gathering of all the saints together in a local region in order to worship and praise our Lord and our God. This is a priority for us, not just because we love God, but we also ought to love one another. Those that are not here in our midst, for whatever reason it may be, we lack because of that. When one member suffers, we all suffer together, and we need all of the saints together. You are important to the worship that happens here. You say, well, all I do is sit here and, and I sing. Yes, you sing. Your voice radiates out with the praise of God, and that's not an insignificant thing. Well, all I do is sit here and I pray. Yes, you pray. And the prayer of a righteous person avails much. That's not an insignificant thing. Oh, well, all I do is hear the preaching of the word. Yes, you hear the proclamation of our king of the universe to us, and that's not a small thing. Oh, well, all I do is come and take of the Lord's Supper. Yes, you feast upon the promises that Christ has given us, and that's not a small thing. Your participation in the worship service is not small. Also, second thing, worship is ordered it's not confusing. So there is an order to worship that means this corporate gathering that we get together isn't just a kind of loosey-goosey, we're just kind of here doing whatever we want. We have a purpose for being here, which is the worship of God. We see this in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, verse number 33, and verse number 40 of 1 Corinthians 14. Another thing, uh, aspect of uh, this corporate worship of the church is it's overseen by elders. That there are those that are appointed to oversee, to make sure that these things are orderly, these things are done properly. Uh, we see that in 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5. The, the last aspect of what encompasses this corporate worship together that we should spend our time on is it's done by churches assembled together. And we see this all throughout the epistles of the New Testament. That The Apostle Paul writes these letters to the churches, assuming that they are together and hearing these things read as one. Now, why do I mention all of this and how important it is? Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter number 10 and verse 19, this dedication of the worship of God, just as they did in Ezra. Normally, people listen to and they hear uh, the admonition um, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some is. And they say, well, that's what we need to do for church. But the Bible actually gives a reasoning behind it, not just a bare command. And this reasoning is for your good. It's not just, oh, do this, go to church and you're good, or don't go to church and you're bad. That's not the message. In Hebrews chapter number 10, starting in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus... And by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of God. Okay? God has saved us. He's redeemed us. All those bulls and rams and goats that they sacrificed, we don't need that anymore. We can enter into the holy place of God. Verse number 22, what do we do then? Let us draw near with a true heart full of assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So the first thing is we draw near to him because of the salvation he gives us. Verse 23 gives us another application of his salvation. Let us hold fast the covenant of our hope, a confession of our hope, without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. So we should draw near. We should hold the confession of our hope. Verse 24 gives us a third application of what his sprinkled blood does for us. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So, we should draw near to him. We should hold fast our confession of the hope. We should consider how to stir up each other. Well, how do we do that? Verse 25, 
not neglecting to meet together, as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is how you do those things. You do that here, together. That is how we draw near. That is how we hold fast. That is how we stir one another up to good works, by this corporate meeting together of the body of Christ. That is why not neglecting is so important. Because while you get benefit, it's not all just about you. It's about us. We're in this thing together. We're not alone in this Christian walk. We're bonded together by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why Ephesians 4 says this. Listen to these words. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all, And then he continues down in verse 11, and he, Christ, uh, of, of Ephesians 4, gave the apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is a love meeting where we gather together and build each other up in this love that is here, the the measure of the stature of Christ. This is the purpose of the church. This is why it exists. Our mission is, of course, that great commission to go out. But why? So that this can occur. So that this can happen. So that we can grow up to mature manhood in Jesus. If we are walking in God's hand, then we need to make time of dedication in worship. Point number two. Walking with God's hand responds with prayer and fasting. A a dedication of food. We see this in verse number 21. Then I proclaimed a fast there at Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey. He had this issue, this problem, that they have this massive amount of gold and silver and donations. And if you're going to go through any kind of travel in the wilderness, you may be attacked along the way because word gets out that you have all this massive gold and silver traveling with you. And so there was a suggestion of why don't we have this band of soldiers go with us from the king? Why don't we have the, the, the military go with us to protect us on the way? But Ezra said, no, our, the hand of our God is on us. This is going to be a lesson, a a signal, a sign to all those nations that God is with us, not just chariots of the king. Now the distance here between Ahava and Jerusalem is about 900 miles. They have a long way to go. A large caravan of their size could travel at a speed of about nine miles a day. Thus the journey lasted about four months, a third of a year walking through the wilderness. So he says, we stop there to pray and to fast before our journey. What is prayer? It seems so easy sometimes, and yet it gets lost in the day. We know from our children's catechism question, this answer, prayer is talking with God. What a simple way to put that. It's talking to God. And it says even in that catechism question that the Lord has given us this, this Lord's Prayer on, to teach us to pray. If we don't know the words, if we don't know what to say, he's given us this pattern that we can follow. The longer catechism says this, is asked what is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God in the name of Christ by the help of his spirit with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercy like that. Giving up our desires to God. What do you desire most? 
what stirs in you, whether for thankfulness and praise or stress and turmoil. What's in your heart? What's going on inside of you? You give that to God. You talk to him in prayer, both for the confession of your sins, of what you've done wrong, and the acknowledgement of thankfulness to him for all the blessings he's given you, for his love that he has poured out upon you. But they didn't just pray, they also fasted. You know, for a period of about 100 years, there was not a single book in English written about fasting. Fasting is not a very popular uh, uh, subject to talk about. Fasting comes from the Germanic word that means to observe or hold fast firmly over oneself. We know this from words like breakfast. You're breaking your fast in the morning. There are two kinds of fasting. One is an involuntary fast, and we see that in either grief or sickness. If you've ever been so racked with distress that you just can't eat, so, so racked with either some kind of depression or sadness or sorrow or whatever it is that you just can't bring yourself to consume anything, it's involuntarily thrust upon you, this fasting. There's also some of sickness, and uh, I've seen this in, in hospice many times. When the body starts to shut down, so too does the desire to eat and the desire to feed. And so this involuntary fasting can occur, but there's also voluntary fasting, which is a deliberate withholding of a lawful activity for a spiritual purpose, for the promotion of prayer, specifically withholding food or water for a period of time. Spiritual fasting is distinct from other sorts of fasting that one may do. Spiritual fasting is not for weight loss. It is not for medical reasons, such as a surgery that's going to come up. It is not for stress relief. It is not for detoxing all of the things that are in your body. It is not to brag or to show off to see how holy you are to everybody else. In fact, Jesus says you should wash your face and put on a good countenance if you're fasting. It is not to earn righteousness from God. It is not to alter our consciousness to enter into some other kind of plane. Fasting is also not to punish yourself with some kind of self-denial like a medieval monk. Jesus, however, did assume that his disciples would fast. He said to the Pharisees, they don't fast with me now because the bridegroom is here, but one day they will. And he gave us instructions, not if you fast, but when you fast, this is what you do. Christ himself fasted for 40 days to fulfill all righteousness. So quickly, I will go through, run through about 10 aspects of what this fasting is. And you say, 10 aspects, it will go fast. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5 says that religious fasting is an aid to prayer, and it doesn't happen by itself. When we see fasting, it is connected to prayer. Prayer and fasting are coupled with one another. Now, surely you can pray without fasting, but if you fast, prayer is the reason you do it. Sometimes we think about like a, a, tying a, a string around your finger so you remember some kind of appointment. I don't know that anyone actually does that anymore, but people used to tie a string around their finger to remember something. Fasting is that wonderful little thing that any time you get that hunger pain, you remember, oh, i got to pray. This world can be very distracting to us. It's a, a built-in timer, a built-in mechanism that can spur us along into prayer. In fact, in Acts 13, 1 through 3, and Acts 14, 21 through 23, it says that fasting is part of the ordination process. Before someone has their hands laid on them as an elder, an overseer of the church, they should engage in a period of fasting. Uh, third point is that it puts the most fundamental need into subjection. I mean, sometimes we think, well, I need my time. Well, God says to give him some of your time in worship. Well, I need my food. Philippians 3, 17 through 21 talks about those whose God is their belly. They serve at the dictates of whatever their belly wants. And as soon as it has a slight tinge of some kind of desire, it instantly runs to fulfill that desire. Rather, what 
fasting does is it puts even that fundamental need into subjection. Jesus Christ himself, when tempted with food, when he was fasting 40 days, says, talked about the bread of God is what we need. You don't need food as much as you think you do. We think it's this vital aspect of life, but when we go without it, we get fed something more, something spiritual from God. Fourth, it identifies us with the poor. Isaiah 58, 6 through 7, talks about a fasting to, to show us this need to remove oppression and to share with those that are needy, that there are some of those that fast involuntarily because of abject poverty. We don't have anything. It helps us to be more compassionate with those that are needy. Number five on fasting gives tangible actions and seriousness to prayer. Psalm 35, 11 through 13, and Isaiah 58, 1 through 10, that sometimes we think, well, prayer is such a cerebral thing. I want something I can do, something tangible. Well, how about this? You wanted your prayers to be something tangible? Don't eat for a little while. See how tangible your prayers become. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, point number six, it is a training ground in prayer without ceasing. Remember how that, that tinge of hunger ought to drive us into prayer? Well, 1 Thessalonians says the command, we should pray without ceasing. We should always be in prayer. Well, not going without food is a great reminder to always be in prayer. It is the way of expressing grief, solidarity, or concern. I won't read all the passages here, but all throughout most of the Old Testament, this is the fasting that is done. It is relating to mourning and repentance and cries for mercy and sackcloth and ashes. A way of expressing great sorrow and grief, but also solidarity with others. What do I mean by that? Weeping with those who weep. Struggling with those. There was a person I, I once knew, and um, uh, not, not in this church, and um, he gave me a call, and we find out that his, his wife was unfaithful to him. Great grief and sorrow that was over that poor family. And so I decided to start fasting and praying for them and their marriage. And what had happened for forgiveness and repentance and restoration to occur. It wasn't my sin. It wasn't something I was participating in. It wasn't my family. But in solidarity to their grief, I expressed my grief through fasting. And we can do that as well, to connect our sorrow with the sorrows of others. Number eight on fasting, it is a way to promote repentance and self-reflection. Daniel 9, 3 through 10, he did this. He looked introspectively during this period of fasting to see where he had gone wrong. And what he needed to do. Point number nine on fasting, it's a way to engage in spiritual warfare. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 14 gives this admonition that he will not be dominated by anything. Nothing has rule over me and this is a way to break those rules where we think we just have to have it. And point number ten, there are times that we as a community may fast together. Our confession talks about setting a time, solemn occasions for prayer and fasting. In fact, we have one coming up pretty soon. There's this, this period leading up to Easter that some people know is Lent, that, that you give up something for God, but taking this time of solemn humiliation and prayer and repentance and reflection to see what God has done. So, consider what that might look like. Not in a legalistic way of saying, well, Pastor Eric, how many times do I have to fast? And how much should I fast? And how many hours? And what kind of days? Not in that way. But seeing this as another tool, another challenge to how you can grow in Christ. Last point. Walking with God's hand responds with a dedication of resources, of money and talent. You say, Pastor Eric, didn't you talk about money last week? Yes. And Ezra talks about money this week, too. So we're going to talk about it again. He gives, gathers all these people, and then he says in verse number 29, guard them, all these resources that they have, and keep them until you weigh them before the chief priests. The amount of gold that they had was equivalent to three and three-quarter tons of gold and 24 and a half tons of silver. So this is literally tons 
of material that they are taking 900 miles through a wilderness that they may be ambushed over. They didn't want the king's retinue of soldiers. It doesn't mean, however, that they saw responsibility of their own safety as nothing. Ezra still appoints guards over them. They don't have tanks going down the road with them, but they do have people selected and people there to guard this treasure in case there's some kind of an ambush on their road trip. They made sure there was select men. Trusting God doesn't mean pie in the sky, irresponsible living. Well, yes, we don't want the big retinue of soldiers. However, we still are going to take some precautions. Trusting God often means wise action of God's people. We must be wise in what we do. Last week I gave the admonition to you, and I repeat it again, of consider this year, especially as tax return season is upon us, of giving 3% more of your income than you previously did. That if you were at 7% and you added 3% to this year, that's 10%. That's that, that kind of guideline for giving that the Bible gives. If you were at 0% last year, then consider 3% this year to the service of God. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 9 says. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his own heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, because I'm not going to make you. <laughs> for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work, as is written. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, with which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel and the generosity of your contribution for them and to for all others. While they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you, thanks be to God for your inexpressible gift, the Bible says. Notice how it puts that phrase of giving. I think, well, I've got to have my time. Oh, no, beloved, you find your time when you give it up to worship to God. i got to have my food. <laughs> you know what? When you give up some of that food, you realize the blessing of God when you have it again. i got to have my money. Ah, oh, but when you give it up, then you really true why it's even there. God is waiting with these abundant blessings upon you. And I'm not saying they're going to be money. I'm not saying you're going to get rich because you give to the church. That's not the point. But God does promise spiritual blessings to those who give. It says, notice here, in verse number 28 of Ezra 8, And I said to them, You are holy to the Lord, and the vessels are holy, and the silver and the gold are free will offering before the Lord. When you dedicate your money to God, it transforms your finances into holy finances. Set apart for sacred service. Last one, last slide, and this is that point number, point five, that half point. So, walk with God's hands because you are worthy, holy. Verse 28, he directly gives this admonition. You are holy to the Lord. You see, we don't do these things to get holy. It's not, I need to go worship with God so that then I can be transformed and have some kind of righteousness of my own. It's not, I give to the church and that gets me something with God. It's not, oh, I'm going to fast and then God will love me for more. The fact is, God already declares his people holy and that's why we do these things. We are walking hand in hand with our Father. Now we can, we can walk with an easy gait along with him or we can pull and struggle and make our body go limp while he's dragging us, but he still will hold on to us. He's still not going to let go. 
This is how we walk in step with him, by giving up these things, realizing he is our self-sufficiency, not our time, not our food, and not our money. The same word here, you are holy, is the same word we get for holy ground when the Moses is before the burning bush. It's the same word we get for the holy temple worship. It's an apartedness, a set-asideness, a sacredness. We have this not as a holiness or essence of ourselves like God, but a derived holiness that he gives to us because we are who he says we are. You don't dedicate the things of time and worship, prayer and fasting and your resources in order to get God's good hand on you. That's not why he grabs your hand. You do them because his hand is already upon you. Deuteronomy 7, he calls out the people of God, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. His treasured possession. God treasures you as his people. Last passage we'll look at. 1 Peter 2.5, and we're just going to read right through it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5. You yourselves, if you have come and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, forsaking your righteousness, trusting only in his sacrifice that satisfies the wrath of God so that you are now his child, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but not for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Say, well, Pastor Eric, I don't feel holy. I feel kind of nasty. I feel kind of shameful. I I feel so sinful in me. And the more I try and try, it just seems like the weight of my sin gets bigger and bigger. God is bigger than your sin. God is bigger than your shame. God is bigger than the feelings of your guilt. God is bigger than your own mind. And he is the one that says you are holy because you're mine. We take on the attributes of dad. My sons and my daughters look a lot like me. They take on the attributes that they get from their father. He declares us his and takes on the attributes of him. He's given us a reason to exist, to proclaim the excellencies of him because we have received Mercy from him. So we don't have to walk anymore as sojourners and exiles. Notice these people in Babylon. They're coming out of Babylon in exile. We don't have to act as exiles before God. We are exiles before the world. We are at home with God. We are now a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a holy people knit together with him. How is this possible? Because you say, well, see, I know my sin. Pastor Eric, oh, if you knew all the thoughts and deeds that I've done, you wouldn't think that I was so holy after all. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I I can declare you holy, not because of your righteousness and not based on my authority, but based on the authority that we get a picture of in the Lord's Supper, that Jesus Christ bled and died and took on the sins of his people. It says, 
He became sin for us who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He took on all the pain and suffering you've ever done to yourself and to somebody else. All the offenses you've done, he took on himself, paid for that, so that you can stand before him completely righteous, completely pure, completely free of shame and doubt and sin. This is what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper. So, beloved, as we turn our our hearts and minds to this, let us walk in the hands of God. Let us walk by giving up our time, our food, our resources for the thankfulness that we have to our God and Father who has adopted us into his family. At this time, Pastor Skip is going to come and administer this Lord's Supper for us.